Hey team, this is just Mr. True here with you and we're gonna do a redox titration. Um, normally we'd want you to do this in class, but uh, this is as close as we're gonna get. Don't mind the Beats audio, that's my microphone, so not normally something that I would encourage or allow in my class, but uh, you know, got the goggles, got the apron, and uh, we've got our chemicals here. So this is gonna be a redox titration and redox titrations are very similar to acid base equilib or acid base titrations. The difference is that my reaction is not going to be obviously an acid base reaction. We don't have a neutralization occurring. Instead, we have a redox reaction and we're gonna have our um, two chemicals that we add together are gonna have a change in color based on redox chemistry. So in this case, I've got potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate is in my burette. So my potassium permanganate is my titrant. My titrant is going to be added to my sample, and my sample in this case is going to be iron 2 sulfate solution. So I've got some iron 2 sulfate solution, and I'm gonna to need to pipette my 10 milliliters of iron 2 sulfate solution as my sample. Now, the iron 2 sulfate solution, I've already washed and conditioned my pipette. We learned to do that in Chem 20, um, so not really wanting to spend a lot of time going back over that. But I'm gonna do my best to use volumetric technique to measure the 10.00 milliliters correctly. So you did this in your lab exam, and so I'm gonna lower the meniscus so that we get 10.00 milliliters exactly. I'm gonna transfer it to my Erlenmeyer flask. And there was some water in there, doesn't matter, right? If it's pure water, it's not uh, contributing to any reaction or change. Now the iron two sulfate has been acidified. So this solution was made by adding the iron two sulfate solid to sulfuric acid. So they both have sulfates in common. So really I'm mostly just adding acid particles which are necessary for the redox reaction to take place. The iron two sulfate solution that's been acidified is gonna react with my potassium permanganate. My potassium permanganate, which is a deep purple color, is gonna turn colorless as the reaction goes forward. The manganese ions are gonna be in very low concentration and we're going to be watching them disappear and eventually the color is gonna stick around. That's when I reach my end point and we will be using that end point for our calculation. So right now I've measured my volume. Um, I'm at 13.30 milliliter or for me 13.50 milliliters and um, potassium permanganate is a little difficult to actually read the meniscus so because it's so dark the meniscus that drops like this is too dark to actually see the line and resolve where it ends so I'm going to count from the top of the meniscus and there'll be a perhaps a very, very small amount of variation in the volume, but as long as I'm reading the meniscus the same way, it should be the same net difference, so it doesn't really matter. Volume initial uh, is taken from volume final for the change in volume. So I'm gonna do my titration now, and when we're done this one trial, I'm gonna explain to you what the rest of this experiment looks like, and then we're gonna post the results online so that you can follow and do the math um, and hopefully it all makes sense. So some key points are that we've got the burette. The burette is filled with the titrant. The sample is in the Erlenmeyer flask. The reaction is a redox reaction. The color change is because of our redox reaction. And we'll go over that a little bit more um, in the discussion about redox titrations. Let's do this titration. So I'm going to add my sample and you'll see that the pink color is, or that deep purple color is going away. And as I agitate it, it's gonna start sticking around a little bit longer. And it's persisting a little bit longer, but not really long enough to bother being too worried about it. I'll rinse down the sides in case there are any drips there. And I'm gonna continue. 
looking for that one drip that's going to make the color stay. And so, the exciting part, right? The slow and painful process of titration, but um, precision is what we're looking for. And this is being used, this particular titration is being used to standardize the potassium permanganate. So potassium permanganate is not very stable. Um, I touched the side there, so I'm gonna wash those down to make sure they get in to react. It's not real stable when you first make it, and it will react with all sorts of stuff because it is such a strong oxidizing agent. It's at the top of our redox table. And so when you mix it with the water and any impurities in the water, that permanganate could oxidize those chemicals. And so you never actually know its concentration directly from making the concentration. Just have a good idea. All right, this is a little slow and I'm getting talky here, so I apologize. Um, Drips are lasting a little bit longer. Good times, folks, good times. Okay, so now I'm getting to the point where I've got just a hint of purple. I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but we've got enough here that it's a faint purple color. That means I've added a drop that is persistent. I may have added two drops. It's, it's probably uh, needs to be repeated. But it's a fairly faint color, so I know I'm close to the right amount. Um, if I did a back titration, we could see if that last little bit of iron 2 sulfate was enough to make it go back. If it did, I'd be so happy. Um, and so it's gone back to colorless. And so we know that through the back titration that this has worked out correctly. And my final volume now is going to be 20... 26 point, hmm, I'm going to say 9, so 26.9, and uh, I will can collect the data for the rest of the trials and post those. I just want to mention though that we're not done this experiment. So this experiment actually uses this experiment to find the concentration of iron 2 sulfate. So we're standardizing the iron 2 sulfate. Once we have completed finding the trials for that, I'm going to instead then be taking some peroxide and I will acidify that. So I'll take 10 milliliters of the peroxide solution and put in five milliliters of acid and then do the trials again. And in that case, I'm going to calculate the concentration of hydrogen peroxide using the standardized concentration of potassium permanganate. So once I've found that potassium permanganate's concentration to a real certain amount of precision, I'm going to then be able to use that to calculate the concentration of peroxide. And that's what we're going to try to get you to do in this 